Well, good morning. Thank you all for coming and welcome to our second annual Reynolds Symposium on Media Courts and the Law. My name is Brian Richardson. I'm head of the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications here at Washington and Lee. Uh, and we are very excited and intrigued by our program today and tomorrow. And we invite you to participate with questions and your own observations, whether you come from journalism, law, or elsewhere. Um, feel free to, uh, to participate. Um, that's why we're here. This symposium is a collaborative effort of the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications and the School of Law here at Washington and Lee, made possible by a generous grant from the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation and the university's Tucker Lecture Program. I will introduce our distinguished dean of the law school, Rodney Smola, in a moment, but I want to take a moment now to acknowledge our other distinguished participants during today's and tomorrow's sessions. Um, most of them will be joining us later. Um, but with us already, uh, besides Dean Smola, is the Honorable Alex Kaczynski, Chief Judge of the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. When Judge Kaczynski was appointed in 1985 at age 35, he was the youngest federal appeals court judge in the country. He's a well-known free speech advocate and has been mentioned as a possible U.S. Supreme Court candidate. Uh, we will have a fuller introduction of Judge Kaczynski uh, before his remarks later today. Erwin Chemerinsky is founding dean of the law school at the University of California, Irvine. He's a former law professor at the University of Southern California, DePaul, and Drake Universities. He's an expert in constitutional law and federal civil procedure and a frequent commentator on the Supreme Court. Jim Brady is vice president and executive editor of the Washington Post's online division, WashingtonPost.com, the board member of the Online News Association, a former vice president and editorial director of AOL, and a former sports reporter and editor at The Post. John Harris is co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Politico newspaper and the website Politico.com, longtime reporter at The Washington Post, author of The Survivor, Bill Clinton and the White House, and co-author of The Way to Win, Taking the White House in 2008. A change in your program, Mike Allen of Politico.com is unable to join us because of a family emergency. He was scheduled to be on panel in the morning. But we are pleased to welcome Jean Cummings, chief lobbying and influence writer for Politico.com, who has covered politics at every level, including five presidential campaigns. Her coverage has ranged from documenting the rise of well-financed independent political organizations to dissecting presidential candidate fundraising to tracking a wave of new companies opening lobbying shops in Washington. Ms. Cumming, again, will replace uh, Mike Allen on tomorrow's panel discussion. Professor Robert A. Strong is Associate Provost, Director of the Rupert H. Johnson Jr. Program in Leadership and Integrity, and the William Lynn Wilson Professor of Politics here at Washington and Lee. He's written widely about presidential politics. Again, I refer you to biographical sketches in your program for all of today's and tomorrow's participants. Please join me now in thanking them for their willingness to join us for these two days. I also want to take a moment to mention a couple of logistical things and then to acknowledge a couple of people. I know that because of class conflicts, many of our law and undergraduate students will not be able to remain with us throughout the day. We understand that, and we thank you for your willingness to join us. When you have to leave, feel free to do so. We won't mind, but please stay if you can. I remind my colleagues on the Law and Journalism and Mass Communications faculties that you are invited to join us for lunch with our symposium participants after our second session concludes at 11.30. Lunch will be upstairs here in the law school. Um, you can simply follow the people who know where they're going. This morning, I'd also like to thank two people for making our two-day program possible. The first is John Muncie, our Reynolds Programs Coordinator in the Journalism Department. The second is Florentina Butler, who worked closely with John from the law school. Together, they've done a fine job putting this year's symposium together. As many of you know, for us to bring so many distinguished guests together at one time involves months of planning and coordinating schedules. So please join me in thanking John and Florentina. By the way, if you need anything over the next couple of days, please see John. I don't know enough to be able to help you. And so to our program, 
And our first presenter, who will preface his presentation, I believe, with some welcoming remarks of his own. Dean Rodney Smola is nationally recognized as a scholar, teacher, advocate, and writer. His wide-ranging scholarship includes four legal treatises, a casebook on the First Amendment, a co-authored casebook on constitutional law, and scores of articles in the nation's top law reviews. He also writes widely for general audiences, including popular books such as Deliberate Intent, Free Speech in an Open Society, Jerry Falwell versus Larry Flint, and Suing the Press. His commentaries appear frequently in national print and electronic media. Dean Smola's writings have won frequent recognition, including the ABA Silver Gavel Award and the William O. Douglas Award. He has also won numerous awards for his teaching, including the Virginia State Council of Higher Education Distinguished Faculty Award. Dean Smola has also been a nationally prominent advocate in cases involving constitutional law, civil rights, and mass media. He's presented oral arguments in state and federal courts throughout the nation, including the Supreme Court of the United States. That's a lucky thing for us, because he will use that experience to lead us this morning through what promises to be a highly entertaining, <coughs> frighteningly participatory, and deeply thought-provoking <coughs> exercise. Please join me in welcoming Dean Rodney Smola. <laughs> it's okay with you, before I come to the podium, uh, I have a controlled substance that I need to use for this, and it was, it was, uh, I was warned not to bring it into the room while Brian was at the podium. So if you just admit, so I have it hidden away outside, and I'll be right back. All right. Those of you in the front row, uh, and we need some caution. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome on behalf of the law school. Uh, you know, there's a great deal of discussion these days around the country about uh, UGC, user-generated content. Uh, but this morning, I'm going to engage in UGL. Do you know what UGL is? Justice Lemon, is there any idea? User-generated lecture. All right. So the beauty of this is you're actually going to participate and, and form much of the content. Now, uh, to do this, to do this, uh, I'm going to exercise some uh, power, some legal and some mystical or spiritual, uh, in a few moments. Uh, first, let me talk about the legal basis for the power I'm about to exercise. There is an obscure but significant uh, provision in Virginia law that actually gives to the state's eight law school deans certain <coughs> legal appointment powers. Very interesting provision. Uh, and, and other certain legal powers. We can perform marriages in certain, in certain situations. If the love boat pulls into Norfolk Harbor, for example, we can perform marriages there. Uh, but the interesting power is a, is a power of appointment. And uh, deans may appoint people to either state or federal office on an interim basis for a period not to exceed 45 minutes. Okay, And there are some federalism questions about this, uh, but I have, I've been using this power for over 10 years. I've never yet been sued, uh, so we're going to try it. So in a few minutes, I'm going to appoint all of you uh, to the Supreme Court of the United States, where you will be associate justices, and we'll hear oral argument. All right. Uh, and I'll first brief you as your law clerk uh, and bring you up to speed on the case and one significant federal statute that is involved in the case. Uh, and then, because the budget for this conference was relatively tight, uh, I will also play the role of the first advocate, the petitioner, uh, and then play the role of the second advocate for the petitioner. Uh, I came free and we were able to fill three positions at no cost. Uh, and then we will uh, adjourn the oral argument and you will sit in conference as the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States deliberate and vote and decide the issue. Okay. Now let me get to the mystical side of this. Uh, I had the pleasure recently of being at a conference on intellectual property issues uh, in uh, England and it turns out that I got to sit next to the lawyer for uh, J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books. And, uh, 
She uh, gave me uh, a, a controlled substance, uh, which, did, which I actually keep up in the dean's office, and, and I have a little bit of it right here. Can any of you guess what this is? No, no, no. I, it's, it's, it's designed to look like that. That's part of the beauty of it. Uh, now, this is, a, this is a little bit, this is very difficult to, to get through the TSA. Very close, super. Very close, very close, Chief. It's, a, it's actually polyjuice potion. All right? And so if you, if you remember from your Harry Potter, uh, by drinking this, you can be transformed into any, anybody you want. But I can actually use it between the confluence of this and my legal authority, use it to transform you, all right? So I'm going to take a little bit, and then I am going to transform you, and then I am going to swear you in to the Supreme Court. All right, so just bear with me here. <laughs> okay. Transformicus Supreme Corticus. Would you please all stand up and raise your right hands? And, and swear after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. That I will strive to do impartial justice and will to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States for roughly the next 45 minutes. <laughs> Seated. I am now your clerk. Let me give you a briefing on the case you are about to hear. Uh, the case involves an internet site known as sleazycampus.com. Sleazycampus.com is an internet social site that caters largely to uh, college and university students, both undergraduate students and professional students. It has a number of channels within the site. Two of the channels are of particular importance for this case. One, known as the paparazzi channel, encourages, in the words of the site, hot and salacious photographs and video, including, quote, candid camera shots. Uh, a second channel, the Slander and Libel Channel is notorious for detailed and graphic postings in which university students, faculty members, and staff are often accused in graphic terms of every sort of immoral and illegal behavior, typically centered around sexual activity, drug or alcohol use, academic cheating or dishonesty, violence, stalking, and so on. Uh, the paparazzi channel, which boasts uh, of it being raw and uncensored, often contains graphic footage of explicit sexual activity, wild party scenes, Ill illegal uh, drug use. Uh, much of the material posted on the channel uh, is generated by users through the use of hidden cameras, including things like cell phone cameras, often from ostensibly private locations, such as bathrooms, dorm rooms, fraternity and sorority houses, locker rooms, and so on. Uh, according to its posted policy, sleazycampus.com uh, does not screen, censor, or edit posted material, and it boasts proudly on its site that it is, quote, dedicated to the principles of freedom of speech and internet freedom. This case arises from two related postings on the site. Uh, one on the Slybel and Lander uh, uh, Slander and Libel channel and the other on the Paparazzi channel. Both involve the varsity women's basketball team at West Virginia University. The uh, posting on the Libel and Slander channel alleges that a person named Mary Jones, who was a graduate assistant basketball coach uh, for the women's team, is a lesbian who engages in sexual harassment, seducing players on the team. And it specifically alleges that this coach seduced a player, Kathy Smith, into having a sexual affair. Let me read to you this, the exact posting verbatim as it appeared on the channel. Here's the quote. Coach Jones is a sexual predator. 
She prides herself on seducing straight women, introducing them to gay and bisexual life. She seduced Kathy Smith, who was happily married to her husband John, by making it clear that if Kathy wanted playing time on court, she needed to play off court with the coach. Close quote. A related posting on the paparazzi channel is a video clip roughly five minutes in duration. It is taken from a hidden camera that appears to have been secreted in a fixed position within the women's locker room for the varsity basketball team at West Virginia. The clip shows several women uh, who are on the team undressing following a basketball practice session. There are four players that come into view and ultimately all four players are shown completely disrobed and naked. Three of them walk toward the shower and disappear from view. Uh, one of them, Kathy Smith, who is the last to get disrobed, uh, for a few seconds on camera is there by herself on the screen and then the coach, Mary Jones, appears. Jones can be heard to say to Smith, you can hear this on the video, you look great out there today and you look even better now. Jones then gives Smith a slap on Smith's buttocks and the video clip then ends. A lawsuit is filed against sleazycampus.com, a corporate citizen of California, by West Virginia University, by Mary Jones the coach, by Kathy Smith the player, and by the other three West Virginia women's players. The suit is filed in the United States District Court for the Northern District of West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia, the university, sued Sleazy Campus on a theory of aiding and abetting trespass. The three players, the three players who were simply shown naked, uh, sue under two branches of invasion of privacy recognized under the common law of West Virginia. The common law tort of intrusion on seclusion and the common law tort of publication and private facts. I will tell you, by the way, a little inside baseball, that the reason this case is set in West Virginia is that Virginia doesn't recognize both of those torts. And so for the hypothetical to work, I had to move over a state. All right. uh, there are claims for libel brought by the coach and by Mary Jones. They claim in their complaint that they are not lesbians. Uh, uh, first of all, just tell you what Mary Jones says. She says, I am not a lesbian. I've never engaged in any sexual relationship with any woman never engaged in any sexual relationship with any student, faculty member, staff member, or administrator at West Virginia University, uh, never engaged in sexual harassment or seduction of any person, let alone a player, uh, and that the offhand remark, you look even better now, and the slap in the buttocks that is shown on the screen are, these are in the words of the complaint, quote, Mere routine locker room banter and teasing of the sort common in both men and women's sports, close quote. So the complaint dealt with that issue at the very beginning. Uh, the libel claim brought by Kathy Smith is quite similar. It, it says that she's not a lesbian or bisexual. She had no relationship whatsoever uh, with the coach uh, and has never had any bisexual or, or, or lesbian relationship. None of the plaintiffs, none of them, sue the poster of the message. And it appears uncontested on the record that the message was posted through the use of an internet anonymizer service located in the Netherlands, and it appears to everyone effectively impossible to ever identify the poster of these two messages. Sleazy Campus moved to dismiss the case in its entirety. Now, it interposed a number of constitutional, common law, and statutory defenses, but it put most of its energy behind two threshold arguments. The first, its most significant argument, was that the entire lawsuit 
had to be dismissed. All claims by all plaintiffs must be dismissed because Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act provides absolute immunity from liability for all user-generated content. And since the postings were uh, generated by someone other than sleazycampus.com, Sleazy Campus as an internet uh, provider is entirely immune under Section 230 from any liability. Uh, Sleazy Campus also put a fair amount of effort behind a First Amendment defense arguing that all of the claims were barred as a matter of law uh, at, under First Amendment doctrine, except the libel claim. It said the trespass claim and the privacy claims were barred as a matter of law. It didn't attempt to dismiss the libel claim on First Amendment grounds. The motion to dismiss was granted by the federal district judge in the Northern District of West Virginia, although the judge did say that he expressed regret at having to reach a judgment that, in, he, in his view, was, quote, contrary to reason and justice. Uh, the judge first held that it was clear to him that the suit had to be dismissed under Section 230. The judge uh, relied on the explicit language of Section 230, but principally upon a Fourth Circuit decision. West Virginia is in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, a case called Zarin versus America Online, opinion, an opinion written by then Chief Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson, an opinion uh, that was one of the first opinions in the United States interpreting Section 230. Uh, and I'll read you the salient paragraph from Zarin that the district judge deemed controlling. Uh, here it is in the words of Judge Wilkinson. By its plain language, Section 230 creates a federal immunity to any cause of action that would make service providers liable for information originating with a third-party user of the service. Specifically, Section 230 precludes courts from entertaining claims that would place a computer service provider in a publisher's role, thus lawsuits seeking to hold a service provider liable for the exercise of the publisher's traditional editorial functions, such as deciding whether to publish, withdraw, postpone, or alter content, are barred. And so under that authority, the district judge dismissed the case. The district judge also ruled in the alternative that the trespass and privacy claims were barred as a matter of law under First Amendment doctrine. The court reasoned that pursuant to a Supreme Court decision, Bartnicki versus Vopper, the First Amendment bars liability against media outlets for the antecedent misconduct of unknown persons uh, who placed the camera in the locker room. Bartnicki versus Vopper is a U.S. Supreme Court decision in which the Supreme Court held that a radio station could not be held liable for broadcasting a intercepted cell phone conversation when that conversation was dropped in a plain brown bag at the door of the radio station with no idea as to the identity of the, of the person who intercepted the call illegally. Uh, the district court also held that the privacy claims generated from the video clip were uh, immune from liability as a matter of First Amendment doctrine because, first of all, they were truthful. That is to say, what you saw actually happened, so it was truthful speech, and the court reasoned it was speech on matters of public concern because if a basketball coach at a state university is engaged in sexual relations with a player, that qualifies as a matter of public concern. And the combination of those two things required that the suit be dismissed alternatively on First Amendment grounds. On appeal, the Fourth Circuit affirmed the Fourth Circuit essentially adopted verbatim the reasoning of the district court. The U.S. Supreme Court uh, was then asked to take review of the case, and in the petition for certiorari, the petitioners claimed a circuit conflict, claiming that the Zarin decision was in conflict with the recent en banc decision of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and at least in tension with a number of other recent decisions. The Ninth Circuit decision, Fair Housing Council of San Fernando Valley versus Roommates, a decision written by Chief Judge Alex Kaczynski for the majority, held that Section 230 did not entirely immunize an Internet uh, provider, in that case a service known as Roommates, because the provider itself was in part responsible for generating 
the speech upon which the claim was predicated, in that case, a fair housing claim. The Supreme Court of the United States granted the petition for certiorari, and both the Section 230 and First Amendment uh, issues were uh, certified by the court as the questions um, for review. So we will now hear oral argument. Uh, in the Supreme Court, we would hear oral argument for 30 minutes aside. We will make that shorter. We'll make it uh, approximately 15 minutes aside, and that will give you some additional time uh, to deliberate. Chief Justice, and, and by the way, those of you, most of you have been in oral arguments before, but you understand that you are invited to uh, aggressively question uh, each advocate uh, from, the, from the first seconds of the argument. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Rodney Smola, and I represent the petitioners, the various plaintiffs who filed various causes of actions against the respondent sleazycampus.com. Uh, Your Honors, this case involves a federal law, uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, uh, and a particular provision of that federal law, which is entitled in the federal books as Protection for Good Samaritan Blocking and Screening of Offensive Material. It's our submission that what took place here was neither an act of communications decency nor the act of any good Samaritan. The federal law at issue does contain a sentence that says no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Mr. Small, you said that this wouldn't be Good Samaritan blocking, but isn't the argument made that um, the video itself is monitoring behavior of the coach with her players? So couldn't that be Good Samaritan? Your Honor, whether or not, the phrase Good Samaritan as used in the statute, Your Honor, has to be understood against the backdrop of judicial decisions that motivated Congress to pass this provision. In the early days of the Internet, when libel, privacy, and related claims were brought against internet service providers like Prodigy and CompuServe, the law settled into two groups. Those providers that engaged in some effort to police conduct, those providers that were in effect acting like good Samaritans, attempting to block and screen offensive material, found themselves more likely to be subject to liability because the very act of engaging in screening rendered them, under traditional common law doctrines, publishers, editors, and so on in their own right. Whereas those sites that had a hands-off policy and were simply uh, almost in the role of common carriers as passive conduits to the material could, under the evolution of common law doctrine as it stood at the time, escape liability. Congress appropriately saw this as perverse and did not want to punish America Online or anyone who affirmatively attempted to police their own site and so said, yes, Your Honor, no, <laughs> and so said, if you engage in blocking and screening and act like a good Samaritan, that fact alone does not render you liable as a publisher or, or speaker. It's our view that that is probably all that Congress ever intended and that the best way to construe the statute is that it only gives you immunity if you do take affirmative steps. No lower federal court has ever so held, and indeed because the language Congress chose to use appears more sweeping than that, most courts have taken as a threshold matter the notion that, generally speaking, you cannot be held liable for content generated by others. We think, however, there are two exceptions to that. First of all, in the statute itself, in the Communications Decency Act itself, there is a section of definitions. And in the Ninth Circuit decision, in the roommate's decision, the court focused on this. And one of the critical definitions is the definition of, of a content provider, an information content provider. And that language in the federal law says, it is any person or entity that is responsible in whole or in part 
for the creation or development of information, of information provided through the internet or any other interactive computer services. So one core statutory point we are making is that when the provider participates in a kind of joint venture with the user and encourages, aids, abets, cheers, uh, uh, steers, channels the content that causes of action based on the content that is produced by that blend of what the provider... Yes, Your Honor. You, you're not alleging here actual concerted action. Uh, you're not claiming that the... Uh, that the uh, uh, defendant actually planned with the anonymous poster to, 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 uh, to plant the camera out. We, we, we are not, though I will, I will say, Your Honor, that if this case is not cut off at the threshold, who knows what discovery might lead to. But, it, but, but on this record, it's we not have, the claim. We have, we have the complaint we have. We do. And you may seek leave to amend it. To add more, if you if you ever get back to the district court, but to the and so so to, to, the, district, to, to the trial court. But as of now, you have not alleged actual concerted action. Not in the sense that they knew who the the, the so surreptitious taper was, in, in, and prior to the placing of the camera there, said, "Go out and get us this, and and uh, and and we'll post it." But we are alleging. The complaint does allege that the entire business model and all of the material on the screens and the various devices and the culture that has been cultivated by the defendant does in fact say to the world at large, go out and break the law, go out and put cameras in locker rooms and bathrooms, uh, engage in massive violations of both criminal and civil uh, provisions in our society, and bring it to us and we will post it. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Smola, when are you going to get to uh, Judge Wilkinson's point that the plain language of the uh, uh, statute undermines your argument almost completely and that everything you're talking about is simply smoke and mirrors? <laughs> I was going to get to my smoke and mirrors point, Your Honor. Uh, the, we, think that, we think that's not a fair characterization of our argument, Your Honor, because the statute also defines who is a provider of the content in the passive sense. Who is an internet service and who is a content provider? And you can be in both worlds. That at least was the core of the Ninth Circuit decision. And there is probably a continuum between a site that is completely passive in which the plain language and the Zarin holding would probably control and the active participation in the underlying generation of the misconduct, in which case we believe by its terms the statute can't, that portion of the statute is overridden by the definition section, and this hybrid case in which the entire site is conceived as a place where you can go to post things that would otherwise clearly be illegal and for which you would be responsible, and that it could never have been the intent of Congress when it passed this Good Samaritan Law to say what we want to do are encourage internet sites that from their that, that have the raison d'etre, the reason for being of, of encouraging people to engage in libel, slander, invasion of privacy, the portrayal of naked bodies of people without their consent, and so on. And so when you organize your site to encourage that, when a culture develops in which that is clearly what the site becomes notorious for, and when you are fine with that and encourage that, we believe it cannot possibly be that the properly understood intent of Congress was to immunize that. Now, Mr. Smola, are you, are you saying that simply allowing the posting is promoting illegal behavior, that the organization of the site is, is enough to promote that legal behavior, or is there anything on the actual site that indicates that they're promoting this behavior in particular? You know, in the complaint, we go through a number of things that we say are elements of the site that in fact encourage and promote the behavior. Uh, and that is a familiar theme in current <laughs> internet litigation. It was a theme in the roommate's case, in which the court pointed to things like the drop-down menus as efforts to encourage people to engage in illegal behavior. In the intellectual property side of this equation, 
It has been a principal feature of the currently pending case involving uh, YouTube and Viacom, in which the argument is that an entire business model is built around the encouragement of the exploitation of other people's intellectual property. And we think that the reality is, which we would have to take on and prove if the case is not dismissed at the threshold, the reality is that this was an intentional effort by the designers of this site to profit by the illegality of users, and that that was the that was the conception from the beginning behind the site. That's the allegation which we think we're entitled to prove, and we think if we do prove it, it pierces the immunity. Why is the correct mode of analysis using the Betamax decision? Now, the Betamax decision from well, so long ago that I this uh, at least 20, 20 what? years. Uh, you, as you recall, uh, there was a, a copyright case and the contributing infringement case, a little bit different from libel, about what uh, the court there said to Justice Stevens was uh, that if you, if we, uh, if there are both uh, legitimate and infringing users for the device, in that case, the very dangerous VHR, uh, VCR recorder, beta, beta max recorder, uh, and there are substantial uh, non-infringing uses, it will be okay. Why isn't the correct rule to say if the website could be used for illegal purposes or illicit purposes, but also for non-illicit purposes uh, or substantial non-illicit purposes, then it has to be... Your Honor, I think the shortest why, answer... Why, why, why isn't that the right way? Your Honor, I think the, sh I think the shortest answer is that this Court's decision in Betamax has been superseded by this court's decision in the Grokster case. In the Grokster case, the music file sharing service Grokster relied on the theory of Betamax and said when we put software out there that can be used either for copyright infringing or innocent use, we are entitled to the safe harbor that, that Betamax recognized. Uh, this court held, <laughs> no, when the allegation is that you put into the marketplace a device or software for the purpose of encouraging violation of the copyright law, then if that can be proven, if that intent can be proven, either through the face of your software itself or through the discovery that emerges that it looks behind your, your creation of the, of the device, you can be held liable for aiding and abetting copyright infringement. We're borrowing from the, from the theory of Grokster here, which we think is consistent with the common law and not the kind of thing Congress wanted to immunize when it passed this immunity. Fairly, fairly read, I think Ross does not overrule Bacon Max. It defines further what substantial... I, I accept that, Your Honor. And, and, and I think it, if we were to go back and look at your complaint in this case, uh, we could derive that, although there may be legitimate use for the website, you have alleged that those are insignificant, that... that, that and yes, Your Honor. They could theoretically be... Yes, Your Honor. And we, we accept that both as a matter of statutory interpretation and as a matter of classic First Amendment doctrine, that it is that one of the vexing problems is that we often are faced with situations in which a provider of material uh, can plausibly assert that there are legal and illegal uses to the material. Uh, and that is a difficult First Amendment issue. The Fourth Circuit, we should say, uh, is the only court to deal directly with this issue, this issue in a case called Rice versus Paladin Press, which involved a murder manual that, that gave people instruction as how to go out into the world and engage in murder for hire. The defense in that case was that it could also be used for legitimate purposes. It could also be used, for example, to help people write better fiction novels, to engage in self-defense, and so on. And the court there, in opinion by Judge Michael Ludig, was willing to say, if the, if the manifest intent and purpose and principal point of this is to encourage people to engage in illegal uh, conduct, the fact that it is possible to imagine legal uses is not enough. We think that's a sort of First Amendment parallel to the theory of Grokster. It is very consistent with classic uh, common law liability doctrine that would otherwise have applied here if Congress had not intervened. 
We don't think it's at all inconsistent with First Amendment theory, uh, and we do think that it cannot be that Congress intended the sweeping immunity. I have only a minute left, Your Honors. I'll simply uh, uh, address for one minute uh, two of the First Amendment claims. Uh, the uh, court below found that under this court's decision in Bartnicki, even if Section 230 did not provide absolute immunity, uh, Bartnicki creates a principle somewhat similar, if you will, to the Section 230 issue that we were arguing, that if the media is a passive recipient of material that may have been illegally gathered, it is, there is a First Amendment immunity that attaches to the media's transmission of the material even though they know there was underlying illegality, but they did not participate in the illegality and may not know the identity of those who does, who, who did. Uh, Bartnicki, first of all, is an ambiguous president, uh, precedent because although it was a 5-4 decision, there were two concurring justices in the majority who said we joined the majority only because we believe the tape intercepted in that case disclosed the, uh, the intent of the speakers to engage in illegal conduct. And it was that narrow position that trumped the protection of the privacy interests of those who were, who were conversing. We have nothing like that here. We have people taking a shower in a locker room where they obviously have an expectation of privacy. But more fundamentally, uh, the lower court and the respondents have argued for a proposition that we think simply cannot be the law. It cannot be the law that the media has absolute First Amendment protection or that any citizen has absolute First Amendment protection to transmit even truthful material, that is to say even material that is on its face what it purports to be, um, uh, merely because they were not themselves directly complicit in the illegality that produced the material. If that were the law, then many provisions of our Espionage Acts, which prohibit the subsequent republication of classified material that has been leaked to a news outlet, for example, uh, could not be used to punish the news outlet for knowingly further transmitting the material because they were not complicit in the original leak. This court has never held that the First Amendment extends so far, and indeed in many, many different contexts, this court permits the punishment of material that is in some superficial sense truthful, but that the transmitter must have known was uh, a form of contraband, if you will. Uh, Thank you, Your Honors. Chief Justice, may it please the Court, my name is Rodney Allen Paul Smola, and I represent the respondents. Uh, Your Honors, the Internet is a vast and extraordinary free speech forum that contains much that is offensive and illegal. There is no doubt about that, and we do not contest that. Mr. Smola, I noticed your uh, opponent never told us what our standard of review is. Could you tell us what our standard of review is? Your Honor, your standard in interpreting the statute is essentially de novo, that uh, you are, um, no deference whatsoever is owed to uh, the Fourth Circuit or the District Court with regard to their interpretation of the intent of Congress. Uh, and your standard of review on uh, all First Amendment matters is again both de novo in that you exercise independent appellate review, though there were no underlying facts here beyond the complaint, uh, and uh, you have complete freedom to apply whatever First Amendment documents you deem applicable. My, my junior colleague will soon learn that we can do anything with Donald <laughs> That's our position, Your Honor. <laughs> That's our position, Your Honor. <laughs> it may or may not be appropriate public policy to create a sweeping immunity for Internet service providers which requires people, if they... Well, I, I was rather taken with that in bank opinion of the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was particularly well reasoned. <laughs> 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 Exactly written as well. <laughs> uh, um, the Ninth Circuit, uh, which after all covers half the world, <laughs> does not seem to be so taken with the Internet. Why should we be? Your Honor, we think that it's not whether the Ninth Circuit is or isn't, or whether this court is or isn't, it's whether Congress is or isn't. 
and Congress made a deliberate public policy choice to subsidize freedom and to, and to prevent Internet service providers from being hampered by the thousands, if not millions. Um, going along with your argument right there, I agree that it's Congress's attempt to promote what some people have dubbed the marketplace of ideas, the Internet. But could you argue that it was also Congress's intent to promote a lawless no man's land on the Internet? That when Congress happen. wants to create legal liability, it knows how to do that. Mm -hmm. Earlier, the intellectual property line of cases was discussed. Well, we'd like to point out that Congress did create a carve-out from immunity and did put law onto the Internet with regard to intellectual property. So under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, you can be held responsible for posting copyrighted material that is generated by others. And there are elaborate takedown provisions, and if you don't comply with them, you may be held liable. <clears throat> there is no equivalent to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for privacy and libel. Congress could have done so if it wanted. It could have created a privacy carve-out or a libel carve-out. It hasn't done so. And it's easy to understand why it has not done so. It has not done so because there are probably thousands and thousands of libels and invasions of privacy posted on the Internet every hour. And it would, it would cripple and freeze the Internet uh, if every time offensive material was posted on an Internet site, the Internet site provider was deemed to be a publisher or a speaker in the same sense that we treat print media as the publisher or speaker. Well, but, but, but your point is taking a much narrower view. I said uh, <coughs> there has to be some active participation by the, uh, by, by the website. Uh, they have to encourage it, they have to, they have to provide it for it. We, we accept that, John. Just, be, just being there, I, a blank screen. I mean, for example, what if you have uh, snuffflix.com and encourage, you know what snuffflix are? Yes. Uh, encourage the <coughs> posting of, uh, of videos showing people being killed or child pornography or tinytopporn.com and encourages people to yes. upload. Why isn't that uh, an active, uh, an active participation? This isn't, this isn't just passively posting what people put there. Your Honor, if I may, I'd like to answer your question on two levels. One, a sort of horizontal answer and one a vertical answer. The horizontal answer is that area by area, Congress is empowered to address a specific problem. And it has done so. So although there is a sweeping immunity, it can reach into the problem of child pornography. It can reach into the problem, if it wanted to, of murder for hire and the depiction of people actually being killed. It has the authority, if it wants, and it has exercised that authority, to remove, remove the immunity case by case. But on a more vertical level, Your Honor, to the extent that the other side's argument is drawing on the Ninth Circuit's opinion in roommates, in which uh, the court held that the design of the site could render someone who was otherwise, who would have been passive, active, right? Uh, it's our view, Your Honor, that the kind of activity that the court relied upon in roommates, in which the site itself forced the user to engage in certain options in which the very engagement of the option broke the law, is different from the kind of hypothetical you've posed, the snuff.com, or this one, the sleazycampus.com, where the site creates a sort of general culture, but doesn't have anything else in its design, in our view, that meets the requirements of roommates. The, the roommates' decision involved people matching up with others to find their roommate. And there were elements on the site, like uh, racial preferences, sexual preferences, etc., that are the very preferences that violate the Fair Housing Act and the fair housing laws uh, of most jurisdictions, uh, to, to basically put into the matching service things illegal under the underlying law, the Ninth Circuit held, rendered the matching service a direct provider of the illegality. But these bullet, your client shows, to title its channels, the slander and libel channel, and the paparazzi channel, which encourages 
kind of salacious though. Yes, Your Honor. Doesn't that make it different from the additional comments portion of the Ninth Circuit found okay in roommates and a, and a site like Craigslist that, you know, that it's just a passive? It's, it's our position, Your Honor, that our client did that because Congress gave it the power to do it. And if Congress had not, if Section 230 didn't exist, our client, my client would not have done so. But once Congress says, you have this immunity, then Congress has opened the door for people to put every kind of space that, that, that is wanted. And so prior to sleazycampus.com, there was juicycampus.com. And, uh, and JuicyCampus.com generally encouraged a culture of, uh, of, of, of gossip and the posting of explicit material by college students one against the other. We've, ad we've admittedly taken it one step farther in our explicitness and the creation of our channels, but we've done it under the shelter of Section 230. And, and it would be pulling the legal rug out from under us in light of how Section 230 has been consistently interpreted by at least a dozen lower federal uh, court decisions over the last 15 or 20 years, that is entitled to a great deal of expectation and respect. If Congress isn't pleased with this court's judgment that text Section 230 does provide this sweeping uh, uh, immunity, Congress can change it, but the court ought not. Uh, Your Honor, as I see, I have only one minute left, and in that time I would like to take a moment uh, to address the First Amendment claims here. It's our position, first of all, uh, that this is speech on matters of public concern. Yes, the complaint self-servingly alleges that this coach did not engage in illegal relationships or illicit relationships with players, and that this was not sexual harassment. But our poster alleges the contrary. And the very creation of that controversy, the accusation itself, that this coach at West Virginia University has engaged in misconduct is newsworthy. And were we the New York Times, or were we the Wall Street Journal, or were we political.com, that is what we would do. We would engage the society in dialogue over whether someone has or has not crossed some moral or legal line. Uh, that's what we've done here. Uh, so clearly this is speech on matters of public concern. The video is what it is. It is truthful in that no one alleges that it is a doctored video or a manufactured video in which one of the coaches has been superimposed on the screen uh, or the player's faces have been superimposed on the screen. And therefore, it's our view that as a matter of First Amendment doctrine, it simply must be the case uh, that because the video is what it is and because the speech at least offers itself to the marketplace as speech on matters of public concern, it is entirely... public concern of having the other three uh, players on the road, this road, and go to the locker room. What, what exactly is they are? They are, Your, Your Honor, incidental, uh, incidental actors in the drama. Uh, they, they are. They happen to be there. Uh, they happen to be caught up in in the transaction that was, that was taking place, and that often happens. That often happens in, in, in reporting on events. Others who are not direct players in the events are swept so up in. There's, no, there's in your view, no responsibility. To out that part of the video that has no possible the, the user may have had that responsibility and the user, whoever posted the site, might arguably be subject to liability to those three on the theory that your honor is suggesting that at least as to them there is no matter of public concern and indeed I should point out, even the coach and the player have argued that it's not a matter of public concern as to them because this involves an illegal sort of bootstrap device or an impermissible bootstrap device. They say, we didn't do anything wrong, so you falsely allege us of doing something wrong. The false allegation now creates the issue of public concern on which you piggyback your claim if you have the ability to show this footage. It's our point that those are all perfectly valid arguments against the ultimate poster of this message, but not against us, that we, under established doctrine, are effectively First Amendment common carriers. I see that my time has expired. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, so we now have, under the program, time for you to deliberate as members of the court. And uh, in real life, I'd be out having a glass of wine or beer after this argument. Uh, <laughs> decompressing with my fellow advocates and figuring out uh, what each question meant and what the likely vote is going to be. So we, I wouldn't be in the room, but 
I'm so curious, I can't, um, I can't avoid eavesdropping. So the floor is open for any member of the court to uh, express any views. I thought the clip out of this was much better. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to agree with that. I think the first side is better. We don't want to be promoting some kind of lawless area on the internet that can't occur offline. But how do, you, how do you address then the fact that there is this, this general immunity that Congress could, in fact, carve out? I mean, are we, will we be overstepping our judicial bounds by saying, no, this is actually what the law means, even though the plain language of the law is something quite different? No, I, I agree that that's a very good point. I think an important thing to look at um, is what the actual word development means in the internet context. I mean, the Ninth Circuit pointed this out, too, that if you look on Wikipedia for content development on the website, it says it's the process of um, researching, writing, gathering, um, organizing. And so in this, they're kind of organizing and gathering all this information to put on their website. And since they are actually developing this type of information, because they're soliciting it in a sense. So the organization of it is enough to bump them into the next level. Also, the organization under headlines, they're clearly encouraging inappropriate material, like libel. And similar to the roommate's situation, they had set it out under the uh, illegal headlines. I think this is a lot more along those lines. And I think that when Justice Jeremy asked that question, I think it was sufficiently answered with a why. <clears throat> Separating it out under illegal headlines would be falling under this different level. I think it's troubling that Congress would create such a broad sense of immunity that you know, it's not in that content. But based on the objection, they have to that. And I agree with Mr. Forrest that it's, it's, we're not, we should not be in the business of you know, promoting the policy. It might not be the best policy, but uh, I think that you know merely the title of libel and slander doesn't rise to the level of participation by the website that that uh, means they should be liable for the poster's content. Yeah, I mean, I can certainly I don't like what this website's doing, <coughs> but if you uh, if you hold them liable, how do you cabin this principle? How do you separate it to make sure that it only separates the good guys from the bad guys? And is that our uh, is that our job? And how do you define passive versus active uh, participation? I mean, you look at news organizations today that are trying to uh, clean up the language in their in their comments sections on stories. Is that active participation? What if the news organization misses something? <coughs> Can they be sued? Well, well that's sure. Exa that's exactly what the Good Samaritan level of the immunity is for. If you stop cleaning up and you miss something, you're not liable for for uh, missing it because you didn't do such a good job. That, that, that's at the very heart of 230. Uh, but you know, 230 was passed a long time ago. Uh, people were, uh, so the internet was new. There was this fear generated by uh, uh, internet groupies that, oh my God, there was this fragile, medium that might not take off and uh, you know here here we're going to stop the 21st century from coming into being if we don't give some immunity so congress got <laughs> still people they got available but you know the internet is not going anywhere even if you want to kill it tomorrow it's not going to die you know it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and swallow all of us I think what Congress would want us to do in this situation is to read its words reasonably in light of experience. And that includes the experience of having people actually, we've seen it again and again, people who actually get hurt by, uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, exposure of private facts on the internet, by libel statements on the internet. I can't believe that that's what Congress had in mind. There's certainly nothing in the legislative history to say that that's that they meant to protect any kind of wrongdoing uh, that is, you mentioned, get on the line. But you look at this, shouldn't Congress be the one to clarify that? And 
Yeah. You know, what, what about the what about the um, the fact that they have specifically carved out the sort of um, they have specifically gone after that in the case of intellectual property, but not in the case of privacy. Well, there are some things that they make. I mean, they've done several things. They, they've been gambling online, um, so you have to go to Europe now to or some European site to, to gamble, uh, and I don't think you can use your credit card anymore. So they managed to do that, and they take care of child pornography. So we know that the internet can react. This is, this is it didn't, you know, it, the internet did not sink when, when they took gambling of the, uh, of the, or when they stopped child pornography. Uh, so the fact that Congress thinks that some areas are sufficiently serious that there's legislation, uh, it seems to me does not by, by, by uh, Negative pregnant suggests that, that they they don't uh, think other things uh, uh, should. I mean, they, they, they ban those things altogether, uh, but that doesn't mean that normal common law of liability, including questions of conspiracy or uh, liability based on complicity, that those shouldn't operate. So you you know, 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 if, if we for Congress to, to, to come on. <coughs> Every time something bad happens on the internet, they'll be doing nothing but. They make, they make putting them, uh, you know, take care of the economy the way they have. <laughs> Judge, let me ask you this. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> One way to think about this is, is what's the default rule going to be until Congress addresses it again? And because the internet moves so quickly, and there's such quicksilver ingenuity driven by both the, crea the creativity of people and the business engine of people, Law is always playing catch up, and I suspect later today we'll hear from you on, on some of your thoughts on that. But if, if the statute we were dealing with gave a court no cover in its facial language for, uh, for, in, for saying, we think Congress had thought about this problem carefully, would have said there isn't this sweeping immunity then you'd be in one position, it seems to me. But here it seems to me the statute gives you a number of pieces of cover. There's first the intriguing title, and in an opinion of the Seventh Circuit by Judge Frank Easterbrook, he talked about the relationship between the, the underlying statutory provisions and the, and the title of the statute and the legislative backdrop. So that gives a court, it seems to me, a legitimate interpretive tool to, to think about what Congress had in mind. But there's also that definitional section, which was at the heart of, of Chief Judge Kaczynski's opinion in Roommates, which, which seems to contemplate you could be both a provider and a, and a content creator, uh, and, and it gives you some cover. If the court rules that it's bound by the sweeping language, then the default will be there's widespread immunity, and it's Congress's job to try to fix it. If it goes the other way, it means there's less immunity. There'll be a lot of case-by-case -case, uh, exploration of where the line lies. Congress is still able to go the opposite direction and, and, and broaden it. Uh, but we're not. We only have six minutes left. Uh, so, <laughs> Professor Renneman? The, the court creates the uh, common law of torts and, and contracts, and the court is free to mold them and uh, response to changes in times and uh, ideas. But going back to uh, Dean Levi's book in the 1940s, a statute gives a court that does not give a court that kind of freedom. And the uh, legislature is free to return to the statute and amend it in light of experience. But it's hard put to argue that the, the court is able to mold uh, modern statute that was maybe the statute of fraud or something like that going back to the 17th century but not uh, section 230. I have my thoughts but I'll see if anybody else wants to <coughs> join issue with the uh, discussion of Anne maybe? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I guess my my rejoinder to that argument would be this the Congress was deliberately altering a classic common law principle when it intervened in section 230. And that common law principle was itself nuanced and complex and had a lot of cul-de-sacs behind it. 
it's perfectly appropriate for a court to say, Congress didn't come in and smash the whole history of the common law here. Congress took one small doctrine, the Good Samaritan Doctrine, and altered it, which, by the way, is not uncommon in tort law. You know that, that there are many uh, similar Good Samaritan statutes that have been passed in the medical area uh, that alter the rules involving the, 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 the rescue of someone, of like a doctor who tries to provide medical aid to someone in peril and who, in so doing, worsens the situation. To encourage doctors to come to the aid of people in peril, laws that are often also called Good Samaritan laws altered that one narrow range of common law liability, but it didn't take courts out of uh, all the other range of common law interpretation that might surround the same tort. All right, well, we are going to, um, uh, two things I have to do. First, I, I, I do need to tell you that your time as Supreme Court Justice has expired, <laughs> though, your, though, your time, though your time as citizen is not. Um, let's, let's vote. Uh, it's got to be a crude vote. We don't have a lot of room for concurring uh, opinions. You can't concur in Part 1A and dissent in Part 2B uh, because of time limitations. But just as a sort of gestalt matter, how many of you as Supreme Court Justices would be inclined <coughs> Uh, to vote with the petitioners and send this case back for trial and development to determine if there should be some liability imposed against uh, sleazycampus.com. Mm. And how many of you would be opposed to that? Uh, uh, the chair interprets this as a 6-3 decision in favor of uh, sleazycampus.com. So I think we now have a little bit of a break time and then the next session will begin at 10.30. Thank you a lot.